Welcome to Paranormal Northwest, a podcast all about the history and the paranormal of the Pacific Northwest. Join me as I tell stories of this great region, the history, the people who live here, and those who may have never left. I took a bit of a break for summer, but now we're back. I have some awesome things planned to finish out the rest of the year, and I can't wait to share them with you all. So thank you for your patience, and I'm glad you came back. For this episode, we are heading to Victoria, British Columbia, a beautiful European city along the Pacific coast. We're taking a stop at one of, if not the most, recognizable locations in Victoria. Today, we're looking at the Empress Hotel. So grab your sweater, your blanket, and a cup of tea, and let's get started. Now known as the Fairmont Empress, this iconic hotel has been a Pacific Northwest staple for over 100 years. Originally named the Empress Hotel, or simply the Empress, the hotel was renamed in 2000. However, Pacific Northwest locals still refer to it as the Empress, so that is what we will call it. Located in downtown Victoria, the Empress is one of the oldest hotels in British Columbia, and arguably one of the most beautiful. With much of the West, both in Canada and the United States, we need to talk about the railroads. The origins of the Empress Hotel date back to 1871, when British Columbia joined the Canadian Confederation. A path was needed to connect the eastern and western parts of Canada. That was my cat. That was an actual cat, not a ghost cat. He's interested in the railroads. So this connection was accomplished by the Canadian Pacific Railway. Also known as the CPR, The railway was officially established in 1881 and has continuously operated for over 140 years. With approximately 12,500 miles of track running from Montreal to Vancouver, the railway serves nearly all of southern Canada, as well as the Great Lakes region of the United States. The Canadian Pacific Railway was Canada's first transcontinental railroad. Just like with many other railways, the CPR is the conglomeration of multiple short-line railroads that spanned across Canada. Initially, the line was established as a freight railway with the intent of connecting the expanding British Columbia province to the eastern coast of Canada. However, the line quickly became the most efficient and practical way to transport people across the continent. This allowed the CPR to become one of the fastest growing companies in Canada and also one of the most powerful. Prior to the railway, the journey from Eastern Canada to British Columbia in the West was a four month voyage by sea. This voyage traveled down the East Coast of the Americas, around the tip of Argentina, then up the West Coast. A condition of British Columbia joining the Canadian Confederation in 1871 was a land transportation link. Initially assumed to be a wagon trail, this land passage would make it easier and hopefully faster to settle the vast British Columbia territory. The planning and construction of the Transcontinental Railroad was a long process, in part due to corruption and upheaval in the Canadian government. Throughout the 1870s, the continent was surveyed and mapped out in order to find the best route for the railroad. Smaller sections of line were constructed in eastern Canada during this time. Finally, in 1881, construction began on the railway. Starting in Bonfield, Ontario, construction moved westward. The original proposed route would have taken the railway much farther north through the fertile Saskatchewan River Valley. However, this was changed with the route being moved closer to the United States border. This allowed for connection with other rail lines in the United States, further fueling trade. However, this new route posed even more challenges, two specifically. The first was that the railway would now need to pass through the Selkirk Mountains in British Columbia. At the time, though, there was no known path through the mountains. The CPR gave a $5,000 incentive to Albert Brown Rogers to find a path through the mountains. With the aid of Native guides, Rogers found a path on May 28, 1881. The pass now bears his name as Rogers Pass. Side note, Rogers received his $5,000 check from the CPR, but he refused to cash it. Instead, he framed it. He was happy to have just found the path through the mountains. It wasn't until railroad executives offered him an engraved golden watch that actually, that caused him to actually cast the check. 
$5,000 in 1881, if you are curious, is equal to approximately $143,000 in 2022. It's a pretty expensive piece of artwork. So back to the story. The second major obstacle this new route faced was that it traveled through land controlled by the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot Confederacy are a historically nomadic group of people living in the Great Plains of the Northern United States and up to the Bow River in what is now the Canadian Rockies. The Blackfoot people traveled this vast area hunting bison and fishing trout. However, by the 1860s, about 20 years before the railroad, the bison population had dwindled drastically. The Blackfoot people were almost entirely reliant on government assistance. This assistance, though, was often spoiled or even failed to arrive at all. This led to the Blackfoot people raiding nearby white settlements for supplies. By the time the railroad was coming in the early 1880s, the Blackfoot people knew that it was inevitable. inevitable. They unfortunately were unable to fight it and the land was granted to the railroad. With the land acquired, the route continued forward. With many railroads, the intent is often to either create new towns and settlements along the route or build up existing settlements. However, the route chosen was not in the most fertile areas, making agriculture extremely difficult. This was also the area of the route that passed through the Canadian Rockies. I have mentioned before in other episodes, but if you're not from the Western United States or Canada, our mountains are huge. When my dad was little, my grandpa got a job working in Washington, D.C., and they moved from Sacramento, California to Virginia. My grandpa recently remarked that although the mountains of the East Coast are beautiful, they are small hills compared to those in the West. So just keep this in mind when we're talking about the mountains. So the CPR had to master amazing engineering feats to cross the mountains along its route. Some of these measures included drastic changes in grade or elevation for the track to follow, as well as many sharp turns, which are known as switchbacks. Although these can be amazing feats in engineering, they are also extremely dangerous for trains traveling at high speeds. The route of the Canadian Transcontinental Railway moved slowly, but was finally completed on November 7, 1885. The first transcontinental passenger train traveled from Montreal to British Columbia between June 28, 1886 and July 4, 1886. As part of the agreement with the Canadian government, the CPR was intent on using the railroad as a way to settle Western Canada. Now let's take a look at Canadian Western expansion. Just like the United States government, the Canadian government had visions of settling the span of the continent. Even before British Columbia was officially part of Canada in 1871, the government was already laying the groundwork for expansion. The vast amounts of land and natural resources in the West encouraged settlement, and more importantly, the possibility of wealth. In 1858, Gold was found in the Fraser River in present-day British Columbia. Although there had been previous, smaller gold rushes found in British Columbia, the Fraser River gold rush brought not only Canadians westward, but also Americans, many of whom had already tested their fortunes in the California gold rush. However, the people who lived in the Fraser River Canyon were not inclined to have all of the miners enter their lands. These were the indigenous people of the region, who claimed the land as their own. Many of the miners began mining on the land with disregard for the native people's rights and customs. This led to the Fraser River Canyon War in the summer of 1858. The influx of people and industry caused the region to grow quickly. However, as the gold was mined and the mining population diminished, the area sank into a recession. Throughout the 1860s, the Canadian government attempted to annex British Columbia, but the people residing there demanded provincial status. British Columbia officially joined the Canadian Confederation on July 20th, 1871. The new province continued to grow slowly and grew into increasing debt, but the expansion of the railroad helped facilitate growth, both in terms of population as well as economically. Now, let's get back to the railway. As with much of the expansion that occurred throughout North America in the latter half of the 19th century, the railroads had a huge impact. When I first started researching the Empress Hotel, I didn't expect to dive so deep in the, into the Canadian Pacific Railway. Honestly, I didn't even expect to encounter the railroads at all. Wait, did you forget that this episode is supposed to be about the Empress Hotel? I almost did too, but fear not, we're getting there. 
I wouldn't be telling you all this other information if it wasn't important. Although I do find it interesting, even if it has nothing to do with the hotel, but it, it is related. I personally have never traveled across a continent on a train. In fact, most of my knowledge of train travel actually comes from the Harry Potter series. Although traveling by train in the 1800s was a much more efficient and comfortable way to travel than by horseback or wagon, it still did not provide all of the comforts many Easterners desired, especially those who were coming from the major East Coast cities, um, like, such as Montreal. To cater to the comfort desired by their passengers, as well as another way to profit, the Canadian Pacific Railway established hotels along its route. Initially, what became the hotels were only restaurants. This was a necessity because the steep grades along the rail line made carrying a dining car difficult. Hotels were established near posts that connected to other rail lines and even to ferries. However, some hotels built in the Canadian Rockies became hotspots of their own. The town of Banff in Alberta was one such place. Many of these hotels became national icons within Canada and today still hold historical significance. The majority of these hotels were built to embody European chateaus. Those built in mountainous areas such as the Banff Springs Hotel are even reminiscent of fairy tale inspired castles. The Canadian Railway hotels were brought to their full potential by the CPR president William Cornelius Van Horn, who we will just call Van Horn because that is quite a mouthful. Van Horn became president of the CPR in 1888 after overseeing the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Born in Illinois in the United States in 1843, Van Horn began his career in the railroads at the young age of 14. He worked his way up in the various railways around the Great Lakes, ultimately ending up at the Canadian Pacific Railway. Van Horn appointed architect Francis Rattenbury to build the Empress Hotel in Victoria. Rattenbury had already established himself in the region, having designed the British Columbia Parliament Building, which, if you have never seen pictures of, is absolutely gorgeous, and I encourage you to look that up as well as the Empress, because it is beautiful too. But we need to take some time to talk about this man, Francis Rattenbury. Francis was born in England in 1867. At only 17 years old, he started his architectural career, working for a British firm. In 1891, at only 24 years old, he traveled to the new province of British Columbia. Shortly after his arrival in Vancouver, a contest was announced to replace the British Columbia Parliament Building in Victoria. Francis won this contest and went on to have a very successful career over the next 20 years in British Columbia. However, Francis was a control freak, and most of his projects went over schedule and over budget. By 1901, Francis had become the chief architect of the Canadian Pacific Railroad's Western Division. This allowed him to design elaborate hotels along the railroad. Keep in mind, at this point, he's only 31 years old. That's pretty impressive. In 1903, he received the commission for what would become the Empress Hotel. But we're going to come back to that because this guy is crazy and we still need to talk about him a little bit more. Francis left the CPR in 1906 because he felt he was being micromanaged. Although to me, it seems that he may have been the micromanager, but I, I digress. He continued to falter over the next few years, simply attempting to finish projects that he had already started. Things seemed to turn though, when he began working for the Grand Trunk Railway as their head architect. Now this was a competitor to the Canadian Pacific Railroad. However, that too fell through, as a general manager of Grand Trunk sadly perished on board the Titanic in 1912. By 1920, Francis's career and personal life were in shambles. His wife refused to speak to him, and their daughter had to carry messages between the two. But in 1923, Francis began an affair with a young woman named Alma, Alma Packenham. Alma was young, beautiful, and a quintessential 1920s flopper. By the time Frances and Alma met, she had already been married twice. Her second husband had also been married at the time their relationship began. Frances begged his wife for a divorce, but she refused. So he and Alma did not hide their affair. Frances's wife finally conceded to a divorce in 1925, and so did Alma's husband, as she was still technically married too. So Frances and Alma married in late 1925. Due to the surround surrounding scandal, no, 
scandal surrounding their courtship and the decline of Francis's popularity in British Columbia, the couple moved to England. They had a son in England in 1928, but seemed to live separate lives, but still lived in the same home. Now, here's where it gets even crazier, because you're probably like, that's not too bad, but it, it, trust me, it gets, yeah, crazy. In 1934, the couple hired a young man to be their chauffeur. This young man, an 18-year-old named George Stoner, became obsessed with Alma. Alma seemed to be interested in the young man as well, and the two began an affair. Alma tends to have a pattern of behavior, just saying. All accounts note that Francis was actually aware of the affair, and he even allowed the young man to live in their spare bedroom. But by March of 1934, Alma had lost her interest in George, and he had attempted to end their affair. However, George often flew into a rage, and he refused to let Alma go. Sometime during the afternoon of March 24th, 1935, Alma and Francis had a discussion regarding her affair. George took this as the husband and wife rekindling their own romance, and he decided to take matters into his own hands. That evening, George beat Francis in the head repeatedly with a carpenter's mallet. Francis was not discovered until the next morning, and he survived another three days before passing on March 28th, 1935. Both Alma and George confessed to the murder, but Alma was ultimately acquitted. After her acquittal, Alma purchased a knife, walked along a river, and stabbed herself in the heart six times, ending her own life. George was sentenced to death, but his sentence was changed to life in prison after public outcry. However, he was released in 1942 to fight during World War II. He never went back to prison and died on March 24, 2000, the 65th anniversary of the attack on Francis. So it's a little bit of karma, at least. However, a silver lining of the story is that Francis and Alma's son, John, grew up to become an accomplished architect in his own right. He was mentored by Frank Lord Wright, who became a surrogate father to him. I told you Francis had a crazy story, but his legacy lasts in the buildings that he left behind as well. So jumping back in time to 1903, Francis was commissioned by the Canadian Pacific Railway to construct an elegant hotel serving the railroad terminal. Francis' design was similar to the other buildings he had constructed in the region, reminiscent of French chateaus. However, the CPR and William Van Horn were annoyed by the repeated delays of the project. Francis was ultimately fired as the head architect in 1906 and was replaced by William Sutherland Maxwell, who completed the project. Maxwell was not nearly as crazy as Francis, so we won't get into that. The Empress has undergone two major renovations since opening in 1908. The first renovation and expansion was overseen by Maxwell from 1910 to 1912. This initial expansion nearly doubled the size of the hotel. Between 1912 and the 1980s, minor renovations were done on the Empress. In 1989, a major $45 million renovation was done on the hotel. This renovation, known as the Royal Renovation, restored historical features in the guest rooms and suites, as well as added a now world-famous spa to the hotel. The Empress Hotel has gone through numerous ownerships over the years, with the Canadian Pacific Railway renamed to Fairmont Hotels and Resorts. This is why the Empress is also known as the Fairmont Empress. The Empress was sold to Legacy Hotels in October of 2000. On June 27, 2014, the hotel was sold, sold for the most recent time. It is currently owned by Nat and Flora Bassa, who reside in Vancouver. However, the hotel is still managed by Fairmount Hotels and Resorts. The Bassa spent $60 million to renovate and restore the hotel, with the intent to preserve and protect the historic landmark. As with many hotels, the Empress has seen many, many people travel through it over the past hundred years. This has left the spirits and energy mingling through the vast building. Some of these inc incidents seem to be paranormal, leading many to label the Empress as one of the most haunted buildings in British Columbia. The most common occurrence seems to be that of a slender man with a mustache walking with a cane. This man is seen walking on the stairs as well as down the hallways. 
Many have speculated that this is the spirit of Francis Rattenbury coming back to the hotel to hear praise for his work. There have also been reports of a maid still going about her duties, even in death. Many speculate that this is the spirit of Lizzie McGrath, a former chambermaid of the hotel. Lizzie worked at the hotel in 1909, and it was common for many employees at that time to live on the premises. Lizzie would say her nightly rosary on the fire escape outside the window of her room. However, one fateful night, she stepped out and sadly fell to her death. The hotel was undergoing renovations at the time, and the fire escape had been removed. One of the, in my personal opinion, creepier stories is that of a former guest. Guests have reported an elderly woman in her pajamas knocking on their door, asking for help. The woman leads them to the elevator, where she simply vanishes. The origins of this spirit are less clear, but it is speculated that she was a former guest who passed away in her room of natural causes. Legend says that the woman would stay in the hotel during the winter and was found by one of the hotel managers. The hotel continued to use her room for some time, but guest reports led them to stop using the room. When a location was needed for an elevator, the room was deemed the best location, which might be why the woman tends to lead, or supposedly leads other people to the elevator. There are supposedly two more apparitions, that of a young girl and the spirit of an employee who reportedly took his life in the 1960s. However, I was only able to find both of those as a sort of footnote in my research. Um, even though I found them in multiple sources, they pretty much just said exactly what I told you. Whether it's truly haunted or not, the Empress is certainly on my bucket list of places to stay. I have been there, but I've only visited the outside, taking pictures on the iconic front steps. You can also hear these stories and many more by taking a walking ghost tour of Victoria, which definitely sounds like fun and is on my bucket list. So that's a wrap on the Empress Hotel. I hope you enjoyed learning about this unique history and some of the crazy stories associated with the people involved. Next time, we're traveling back to Alaska and another chilly haunt. So please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at ParaNWPod. I share photos and fun facts about our locations. Until next time, bye!